before we start. Nathan. The prelim is through whatever homeworks you have now. So I think nine is it, yeah. It, there's, there, and there's not going to be a wavelets question on the prelim. There will be a wavelets question on the final. I want to give you a wavelets homework problem. So I couldn't, didn't get around to putting that on number eight or nine because they're both long already. Is it cumulative? He asks. Well, kind of implicitly it is because you sort of have to know like things, but you know what I mean? Like, like it, I, I'm not going to like say, well, I'll never ask you what injective means or anything like that. But, but you can sort of think of it as focused on essentially the continuous time stuff since the first prelim plus the sampling, which is like the link between continuous and discrete time. Go ahead. Oh, it would be through the, through the chapter called DTFT and sampling. OK, so I forget what number that is. Yeah, maybe. It might be 11. So you can think of it as covering you know, continuous time signals and convolution, continuous time LTI systems, periodic signals and Fourier series as orthogonal expansions, continuous time Fourier transform, and DTFT and sampling. So that's quite a bit of stuff that's fair game. Any other questions? It's going to be like the last one. It's going to be the same. If you just look online, I put up last year's prelim too. It just looks a lot like that. So, and I'll put up answers to prelim two from last year soon. So, or sooner or later. <laughs> Anything else? My thumb is getting better every day. You know, I, I still, I'm still like doing things like left-handed that I would normally do right-handed that involve pressing on it, but. Supposedly, after four weeks, it's going to be all better. And this Friday night will mark three weeks since the accident. So, any other questions? What am I going to do for Thanksgiving? I'm going to Massachusetts on Wednesday and spend Thanksgiving with family. My mom, my sister, her husband, and two kids. My brother's not going to make it. My sister out west never makes it. And then I'm going to drive down to New York City and watch Cornell play hockey at Madison Square Garden on Saturday night against BU. Could be an interesting game. It could be, like, BU is a highly ranked team. Cornell is an underrated team with some really good freshmen. And depending on that goaltending, it could be a make a statement kind of game for Cornell. Or it could be a disaster. Who knows? <laughs> no, we'll see. And while I'm in New York City, I might try to go to the Museum of Modern Art and see this Picasso exhibit, you know, the Picasso sculpture exhibit. We'll see. We'll see. Anyway, any other questions? David. I'm not a big Thanksgiving food fan. <laughs> you know, I don't eat a lot of meat, you know, it's like, uh, let's see, what do I like? Yeah, we, we ha yeah. The, the potatoes are good because my sister makes these like twice cooked stuffed potato. You know, she mashes the potatoes and puts them back in the shells and crunches them up. You know, that's really good. I like that. Yeah. And my niece is getting ready to go to college, so she's been visiting colleges. She came and visited Cornell last. She doesn't want to go to Cornell because it's too big, <laughs> too big and too intimidating. And she wants to go someplace where she can play club soccer. She's a real soccer player, so. Amanda's not here, so I can't tell her that. Any other questions? I know you're just making me stall. <laughs> Once upon a time. <laughs> it is Throwback Thursday, after all. All right. So anyway, we, I talked some more about the DFT, the endpoint DFT of endpoint signals, tried to, tried to cement that kind of correspondence between the signal way of looking at it and the linear algebra way of looking at it. The, the rewrite of the chapter is almost ready. So that'll probably go up this weekend. So we sort of quote unquote finished the uh, endpoint DFT 
theory part. Okay, so the rest of the endpoint DFT discussion is going to be, first of all, I'm going to talk about what I call three elementary applications of the endpoint DFT. And then I want to talk about the FFT, which is a fast way of computing DFTs. And, and as I understand it, I know we did not do the FFT last spring in my version of 2200, but then I heard we were having this conversation over email last night, and Peter Dorschuk said that he, he spends a lot of time on the FFT in his version of the class. Now, I know that James is not here today. He took it from Peter. Did anyone else take it from Peter? Did he do a lot of FFT? I don't remember. We used it in lab. Yeah, well, it's implicitly used in lab because in some sense, that's how MATLAB does all of its Fourier stuff. And whether you want to like t open the hood and see what's actually going on underneath, you know, that's a different story. I know we did it at the very end, I remember. The very end, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's important, it's important stuff. So I'm not, I'm not gonna feel bad like I'm giving you, you know, review, you know, unless you make me feel bad. You know, you do that. Okay, so now, the following three quote unquote applications of the DFT, what, they, what makes them useful, these are useful just because, and, and essentially only because, we have super fast algorithms for computing DFTs. And inverse DFTs. And you may say, well, wait, is there a difference between computing inverse DFTs and DFTs? No. Essentially, it's computationally the same problem. The equations look exactly the same. One of them says x hat equals psi times x, if you're thinking about vectors. The other one says x equals 1 over n psi con conjugate times x hat. So it's the same computation, computing a DFT versus computing the signal that goes with a DFT. So those things help us out here. So first application. So application <laughs> 1. is computing ordinary convolutions of finite duration signals. OK, so how does this work? Suppose you've got two finite duration signals. Let's call them h and x. So you start with given. H is a p-point signal, capital P, and X is an endpoint signal. And the P and the N don't have to be the same. Our goal is to figure out a, a neat way using DFTs to compute the ordinary convolution Let's call it y of h with x. And by the way, uh, for this discussion here, I'm going to assume that these are officially p-point and endpoint signals. In other words, they start at time 0. And you don't have to assume that. What you can do if you had a general uh, length p signal that started somewhere other than 0 and a length n signal starting somewhere other than 0, you could shift it to 0, do this computation, shift the answer back, and you, and you get the answer to your original problem. So just to streamline the exposition, I'm going to assume starting right off the bat, that both of those signals start at time zero. Okay, now you've done a lot of convolution of finite duration things. And you know, if you have h as a p-point signal and x as an endpoint signal, that y is also going to have finite duration. So you note that y has finite duration. And in fact, it starts no earlier than time zero. So y of n is equal to 0 for n less than 0. And when is the latest time it can end? It turns out that it goes at most out through time n plus p minus 1. So y of n is equal to 0 for, oh, let's, let's actually, let's use l for the length of x, because I want to use n for for this. y of n is equal to 0 for little n bigger than or equal to L plus P minus 1. And let's call that capital N. 
In other words, y is a capital N point signal where capital N is given by this. OK. H is a p-point signal. X is an l-point signal. But we can think of them as capital N point signals as well that just happen to be 0 past their original point value. So note, you can view both H and X as capital N point signals as well. Capital N point signals that just happen to be, for H, 0 at times bigger than or equal to P, and at X at times bigger than or equal to L. An N point signal doesn't have to last all the way out to where it is designated to be an N point signal. OK. Now, if you think of X and H as N point signals, Let's have a look at their circular convolution. So regarding <coughs> x and h as endpoint signals, let's say you can compute what we call z equals c conv n of h with x. And later when I summarize this, I'm going to describe how you do this using DFTs and inverse DFTs. It turns out that this actually equals the ordinary convolution over the appropriate range of times. Now why? So let's see. Let's look at the formula. for y. So y of n is equal to h convolved with x. This is ordinary convolution at time n. That's the sum from, say, k equals minus infinity. Let's use m here. m equals minus infinity to infinity. h of m, x of n minus m. That's the definition of ordinary convolution. And because h is something that starts at time 0, this is equal to the sum from m equals 0 to infinity, h of m, x of n minus m. And because x is something that starts at time 0, this sum stops at time m equals n. So this is equal to the sum from m equals 0 to n of h of m, x of n minus m, at least for m big, n bigger than or equal to 0. And in, certainly, it's true for 0 less than or equal to n less than capital N. So that's a formula for y over the range 0 through capital N. And it's equal to 0 everywhere else. So this is y of n. And y of n equals 0 for everywhere else. What about z? Let's look at z. The circular convolution of h and x views, viewed as capital N point signals. So meanwhile, z of n, which is c conv sub n of h and x, evaluated at time little n. That's equal to the sum from m equals 0 to n minus 1, capital N minus 1, h of m, x of n minus m mod cap n. That's the definition of circular convolution. And of course, it holds only over that range. We proceed as usual and split the sum into two pieces to get rid of the mod. So this is equal to 
the sum from m equals 0 to little n of h of m, x of n minus m, plus the sum from little n plus 1 to big N minus 1, h of m, x of n minus m plus cap n. And that holds, again, over this range. Now you see the first piece of this circular convolution looks just like y, the ordinary convolution. What about the second piece? I claim the second piece is 0. Every term in that sum is 0. So the second sum's terms are all zeros. How come? Let's see why. We know that h turns off at time p. So because h of little m is equal to 0 for m bigger than or equal to capital P, because h is a p-point signal, the only possible m values that might give rise to a non-zero term are the ones for m less than p. So the only maybe non-zero terms are for m less than capital P. But if m is less than capital P, that means that the argument of x, so for those m, n minus little m plus cap n is bigger than n minus p plus, and what is capital N? It's L plus P minus 1, which is equal to N minus L. Or there should be, wait a second. N plus L, right. Minus 1. Is there a minus 1 missing there? Yeah. And since little n is bigger than or equal to 0, this in turn is bigger than or equal to L, bigger than L minus 1. Bigger than or equal to L minus 1, but I have a bigger than over there. So the conclusion is that n minus m plus cap n for those values of m is bigger than L minus 1. And what does that mean? That means that the x term is 0 for all the m values for which the h term can be non-zero. <coughs> so thus for those m, minus m plus cap n equals 0. So the bottom line is all the terms in the second sum are 0. If h of m happens to be non-zero, then the x thing has to be 0. Conclusion. The ordinary convolution of y, a y of h and x, so y of n equals h convolved with x at time n, equals secant sub n of h and x at time n equals z of n when n is over the relevant range. So if we, and that the technique of regarding x and p as n point signals, so uh, here's, a, here's a nomenclature. Regarding x and h, I should say, as endpoint signals, 
as above is known as, in the signal processing literature, zero padding. Because some signal processing people, they don't like to think of like an end, a p-point signal as being a signal defined for all time that just happens to be zero before zero and after p. They like to think of it as just p numbers, a vector of p numbers. And to tack on a bunch of zeros to make it into an n-dimensional vector, they call that zero padding. All right, but the bottom line is ordinary convolution of h and x equals the circular convolution of h and x viewed as capital N point signals where capital N equals L plus P minus 1. So what does this do for us? How do we use endpoint DFTs to compute the ordinary convolution of two finite duration signals of this kind, h and x? So here's the, the sort of DFT way to compute H convolved with X, which is Y, where H is a p-point signal and X is an n-point signal, or an L-point signal. First off, quote unquote zero pad H and x into capital N point signals with capital N equals L plus P minus 1. Second, compute the N point DFTs of H and x viewed as capital N point signals. So you're going to have h hat sub k and x hat sub k, and k is going to run through from 0 to n minus 1 of x and h. And this is fast, because you can compute DFTs fast. Third. Use the circular convolution rule to deduce that the endpoint DFT of Z, the circular convolution sub n of H and X, is equal to just the product of H hat K, X hat K for 0 less than or equal to K less than N. And this is just capital N multiplications. And finally, compute the inverse endpoint DFT of Z hat sub K, i.e. Z, and that'll be Y. the thing you were looking for. And that's fast, because computing inverse DFTs is easy. Stephen? Should that say 0 less than equal to k is less than n? Yeah, less than n, correct. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so this is the DFT way to compute an ordinary convolution of two finite duration signals. And like I said at the beginning, I've assumed here that they are official p-point and l-point signals. They start at time 0. But if they don't start at time 0, you can shift each of them so it does. Compute using this, and then shift the whole result back, and you get the answer to your problem. So item 1 is no computational work at all. Item 2 and item 4, those are DFT computations. Those are fast. Item 3 is n multiplications. And there's a lot less work to do this especially if P and L are relatively large, then to compute the convolutions directly, convolution directly. OK, so that's one application of DFTs. And the second one just builds off of this a little bit.
Are we missing something? No? Yes, no, maybe? OK. Just want to make sure. So what's the second one? The second one is block convolution. And what is block convolution a tool for? Block convolution is for computing h convolved with x. Let's call that y. When h is a p-point signal, So same deal on H as for the first application. But in this case, X is not even necessarily finite duration. So what we're doing is we're, and by the way, why do you know that that convolution exists if X doesn't have finite duration? Because Denzel. H is finite duration. Yes, yes. H is finite duration, therefore it can convolve with anything. So there's no, no worries about h convolved with x equals y existing. But here, x doesn't necessarily have finite duration, so we can't just do what we did up there. How do, we, how do we work this up? What you do is you start by taking x and divide it into blocks of length l. And you may say, what is L? What is capital L? L is a user choice. You can pick L. And a little later, I'll talk about how you might want to pick L in certain circumstances. So L is your choice. And usually what happens is, usually but not always, L is significantly bigger than P. But not always. All right. So you. You take x and you divide it into blocks of length l. What do I mean by dividing into blocks of length l? You think of 0 to l minus 1 values of x as one block, the l to 2l minus 1 as another block, and so on and so on and so on. <laughs> so for each little r in the integers, I'm going to define an L point signal X sub R as follows. X sub R, little r that is. X sub little r of N is equal to X of RL plus little n when 0 is less than or equal to N less than L. It's harder in equations than it is to explain in words. I, for each r, x sub r is the L point signal you get by taking the block, the L length block of x that starts at r times L, So taking the quote unquote L block of x starting at time L times R and shifting it, let's make this really visible, so it starts at time 0. So let me just draw a little schematic over here. And they wrote the E capital this time. I hope you noticed that didn't have to erase it and correct it. As before, think of this, think of all the values of x like so. Okay, and suppose this is time 0. And this is time L. The first block of x is these values. So this is the R equals 0. The second block of x is these. This is 2L. 
And what you do is to form each of these x sub r's, you take the block that starts at r times l, and there's going to be one of those for every r in the integers, some over here as well, and shift that either to the right or to the left so it starts at time zero. Fair enough? Okay. So what happens here? It, we have a p-point signal h, and for each of these r's we have an l-point signal x sub r, and we can use the first application to compute the ordinary convolutions of h with these blocks. And you may say, well, so what? Now I have a convolution of h with a bunch of blocks. What does that do for me? Why is there only one eraser today? Because there's dozens down here. There's a, well, there's always a bunch down there, and none of them looks like, you know, recently dead eraser. They all have, like, thick chalk coatings on them. So, so I think you guys have been purloining erasers. Okay, so we can use application one. to find, to compute, let's call it y sub r, which is h convolved with x sub r for each r in the integers using DFTs. And note that y sub r, each of these h convolved with individual x sub r's, is going to be an L plus p minus 1 point signal, again. So note y sub r is an L plus p minus 1 point signal for all r. And why does that help us? This helps us because if you look at x, remember how we figured out these xr's, we blocked x. x is just the sum over all r of shift sub rl of x sub r, right? Shift sub rl of x sub r just takes x sub r and takes it back home to where it came from, namely to start at time r times capital L. Because this is true, comma, the convolution of h with all of x which we like to call y, or I like to call y, this is the sum over all r of h convolved with shift sub r l of x and convolving commutes with shifting we know that so shift sub r l of h convolved with x sub r and that's just y sub r in there So you say, OK, well, now, uh, now I have to, to compute y. I, I, it was easy to compute all these y sub r's using DFTs. But now I have to somehow do this infinite sum to get y, the thing I was looking for originally. Why is life any easier? Well, this is, turns out to involve only easy things to do from a computational standpoint. Let's look at that infinite sum. And the best way I can think of describing this is with a diagram. And this is, of course, you, if you've been reading the monograph, as I know some of you have, 
because you've been sending me typos and suggestions and all that. You've noticed that every now and then I say C figure one, C figure two, whatever, and then there's no figure one, there's no figure two. Okay. You notice that? No, you haven't read the monograph. Okay, if you haven't noticed that, then you haven't read the monograph. Yeah, okay. Confession time here. Um, okay. Those figures will, they exist in here, okay? And they will exist sometime in, in hard, cold, you know, ink and paper and all that stuff. There are, some of them are actually, if you fish around in the course documents area, you can find the diagrams that I'm going to eventually have in the monograph, some of them at least. So that's sort of a challenge to you guys, issued hereby. For figures? For just like, I don't know, typos or? All chapters for typos. But if you want to find, you know, you can just search for the word figure in the PDF and, you know. Yeah. Anyway. The, this infinite sum <coughs> says, so this says, to get y, you need to, quote unquote, splice together all the shifted y sub r's. What does that entail? <coughs> Let's think of this as time. Okay, so here's time. And say here's time zero. How about that? Y sub zero goes from 0 up through L plus P minus 2, okay? So it ends before L plus P minus 1. And let's call that N. Let's just leave it as N. No, let's put L plus P minus 1. This is the range of non-zeroness of Y0. Where does Y1 start? Shifted Y1. Shift sub L of Y1 starts at time L. So this is time L here. So this is the range of non-zeroness. And I'm going to label this with some more stuff. So uh, this is the, this is the quote-unquote range of y0. This is the range of shift sub L of y1, which is the, L, the r equals 1 term in that, that series. And where does that end? That ends at L plus n minus 1. And what about the range of shift sub L, shift sub 2L of Y2? That starts here, let's call this 2L. Like so. So this is the range of shift sub 2L of Y2. And remember I said, not always, but usually, capital L is much bigger than P. That means that, relatively speaking, this L is going to be very close to the end here. And so there's not going to be much splicing to do. How much, exactly how much splicing do you have to do in here? How many things do you have to combine? I right, wrote it. Uh, what's that say next to the N equals L plus P minus 1? Uh, Up top? No, on that word right there. This, this says 2L. Uh, the next one. The next one. Yeah, no, no. L plus N minus 1. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to write L plus N minus 1. Okay, somebody said it. There, there are p minus 1, there's an overlap of p minus 1. So what you have to do to splice two adjacent shifted yrs together is do p minus 1 additions. Simple, very simple computationally. And if L is bigger than, significantly bigger than p, only adjacent, only nearest neighbor shifts will overlap. Okay, so let me just note those two things down.
So if L is bigger than P, in fact, all it has to be is like bigger than twice P, only quote unquote adjacent Y sub R shift ranges will overlap. And each overlap will require for the splicing p minus 1 simple additions. OK, so putting that infinite sum of shifted y sub r's together to get all of y is not a lot of work computationally. David. The splicing involves only the parts that overlap. Because, because like for example, um, the one to the left here is going to come up to about here, right? So you're going to have to do work over this time range. You're going to have to do work over this time range. But no work here, because just that one term gives you the value of, of y for those ends. So when they do overlap, that means that each chunk contains Yes, exactly. Like the shifts of RL of Y sub R's, when they do overlap, you have to do work to add them together to make that infinite series add up. But when they don't, when the ranges don't overlap, you don't have to do any work. Okay? So, so really all you're doing is infinity times P minus one additions, so to speak. But of course there's no such thing as an infinite duration signal. Erica? Well, y sub r always starts at time 0 for every r. The r indicates where we have to shift it to send it home. Right? Make sense? Sure. OK, yeah, so, so you know, I mean, I'm doing a lot of pictures here, but you get the, you get the point that if you want to summarize this, you can say application 1 is the key. Because application 1 makes it easy to compute ordinary convolutions of finite duration signals using DFTs. And here we've used application 1 a whole bunch of times. And then all the only work that's left over is splicing those together to get the whole convolution. And that turns out to be a lot less work. Alex. So do you really want signals to pass and split it up? Because it's the fast time of 1 and application 1. It depends on the signal, I'm sure. You know. His question is, suppose you have two finite duration signals, h and x. H is a p-point signal. P is relatively small. X is an L-point signal. L is huge. Might I want to split X up into L-prime point signals and block humble them? Maybe. Um, and, and here's a hint of when I might want to do that. Question. Suppose I have an infinite duration X and I have a finite duration H as in application 2 here. Under what circumstances is there a natural way to split X up into blocks? Yeah, if x is periodic or constant or whatever, you know, if it's periodic, say, and has l as a period, then if you split it up so that the l is a multiple of the fundamental period of this sequence of numbers, then you only have to do one convolution computation because all the yrs are the same. Okay, so note. And so if you have a, Alex, if you have a really long l, other Alex, because we're doing Alex here. You have to say something next, so. <laughs> All right. Um, if you have a really long L, he asked, might it be easier to, to block out the signal first and then put it back together this way? And it would be, possibly, if that really long L signal happened to be periodic with a relatively short period. So, so here's one instance when a when you can choose L in a natural way. This chalk is not, is not writing very well, is it? Uh, 
and that is when x is periodic and L is a multiple or is a period of x, let's just say. And in that case, all the XRs are the same. Because all of them just re represent a block of x of length of multiple periods. Hence, all the yrs are the same. And so, as far as circular convolutions and DFTs and all, you only have to do that once. And I'll schematize that by saying you only need to do only one secon sub n. And all the rest is splicing. OK, so that's the second application. I'm just, I hate wasting chalk, so I'm going to try to <coughs> fix this. Actually, t let's take the three minute break and I'll try to fix this chalk so, so it actually writes. It writes on the wood here. Be period, periodic with this period, but I'd have to think about that to make sure. So maybe maybe that would be an even easier thing to do. Is just complete compute one overlap because all the computation will be the same anyway. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay. So anyway. Those are two of the applications of endpoint DFTs. And let's consider the final one I want to talk about today. And if you want to learn a really it, super important in today's life kind of application of endpoint DFTs, if you take EC4670, which is digital communications taught by the awesome Professor Wagner, he, a lot of the course talks about this technique called OFDM in digital communications. Really all that is is using DFTs to diagonalize channels. And it uses all that linear algebra we were talking about last time about how the psi diagonal, you missed it, but you know, <laughs> diagonalizes circulate matrices and everything. And that's, that's how everyone, that's the technique everyone uses now to push bits through channels. It's all based on the DFT. And in that course, you actually get to design a coding scheme for an actual channel, which is a little box with two terminals. How about that? We don't have any boxes in this class, unfortunately. But anyway, OK, so last application. I want to talk about application three is frequency sampling. design of FIR filters. OK, so what's the deal? The deal is you have, you have some desired discrete time impulse response. OK, so you have given. You want to build an FIR filter. And I want to emphasize the word FIR. We want an FIR system that, in some sense, quote unquote, approximates whatever this is going to mean the behavior of some infinite duration impulse response discrete time system. a discrete time system with impulse response H sub desired. Okay. 
And this is not necessarily a finite duration. So you want to design an FIR filter that in some sense approximates the behavior of a system that doesn't have a finite duration impulse response. And we call that H desired. What does the technique call on you to do? So here's the procedure. You pick capital N bigger than zero. This is going to be the duration of your FIR system's impulse response. And you take the desired system's frequency response and you sample it. So you take H hat desired, the frequency response of the desired system, and sample it or record its values. If you, don't like to, if you don't like to use the word sampling, unless you're talking about time functions, just say, say something else for it. Sample it at the n equally spaced frequency values. Guess what? k2 pi over capital N. 4, 0 running from k to n. Then compute, using the inverse DFT, the FIR impulse response, the H, that has that as its endpoint DFT. So let's call these values. H hat sub K for 0 through N minus 1. Then compute H the endpoint signal whose DFT, endpoint DFT, is that sequence of values. And that's the H. That's the designed H. So this H is your quote unquote FIR approximation. Unquote. All right. So that's it's a very simple technique to describe and it involves DFTs and that's why we're talking about it. It's something you can do fast. And what I want to do is is look a little more closely at how this H approximates your H desired and under what circumstances it does a good job, under what, what circumstances it does a bad job and all that stuff. Okay, so here's a couple of observations. So first observation is that the frequency response of this FIR system, if I evaluate it at 2 pi over n times n e k, I get the same thing as the desired frequency response at those values. In other words, the FIR approximations frequency response matches up exactly to the desired frequency response at those points in omega space. Why is that the case? That's because the definition of the endpoint DFT is sampling h hat of omega at those equally spaced omega points. So h hat of omega at the, those equally spaced omega points, those are the h hats of k's, but those are also equal to h hat desired at those frequency points by design. So you have this exact matching at these points. And as a consequence, the bigger n is, and this is totally not surprising, the quote unquote 
more places h hat of omega matches up with the desired frequency response. So thus larger n implies more quote unquote exact match points in omega space, more densely distributed in the interval 0 to 2 pi implies in some sense better FIR approximation. And this is totally not surprising. If you if you take an FIR system and you allow it to be longer and longer and longer in terms of the length of its impulse response, you're going to get closer and closer and closer in some sense to what you want. Okay, so that's one thing. Now here's a question. What if you pick n, so here's a question. If, and let's, I don't know if I want to state it as a question. Let's, so suppose your H desired, remember this is the impulse response of the system you wish you could build but can't, has quote unquote most of its activity on the interval 0 less or equal to n less than n. So this, of course, involves picking n large enough so that's the case. And, and that, you know, if you have an H desired that's an L1 signal, for example, it's going to have to die out as n goes to infinity. So you can say, OK, I'm going to pick capital N so all the terms in H after that are less than, say, 10 to the minus 3. You're probably not going to go for 10 to the minus 59th because that'll take you way out. But suppose H desired has most of its activity. Intuitively, we expect, we would then expect, we might, let's, let's put it a little more conditionally, expect H and H hat to match H desired and H desired hat better if that's the case. If most of the activity, then if most of the activity were not on that interval. Now, what's an extreme example of this? So here's an extreme example. If H desired is actually finite duration and ends before time n. So H desired is actually, say, let's say it has duration interval contained in the interval of points 0, 1 through n minus 1. Question. Okay, see, see if you, see if you, uh, this is a question that, you know, I would have to think about if I were in the class today, but if this is the case, if H desired is actually a finite duration signal to start with, whose duration interval starts after time zero, and you pick N big enough so that the, for this frequency sampling design, so that it's beyond where H desired turns off, what will H turn out to be in this frequency sampling design? It will be exactly equal to H desire, automatically. The designed H equals H desire, exactly. So that's an extreme example. But really, that's not going to be the, the situations you're going to be looking at. You're going to be trying to match these infinite duration impulse responses. So, so let's, see, let's see how we can quantify this business about activity and how much better it approximates, how much better it matches, and see how that works. So let's try to quantify, quantify this sort of vague statement 
about quote unquote most activity. Okay, so how do we do that? We can actually figure out an explicit formula for the designed impulse response H in terms of the design in terms of the desired impulse response H desired. And this is pretty cool. And I was debating today whether I wanted to do the derivation or whether I just want to give it to you. And I decided that would depend on how much time was left when we got here. So I'm still debating. So it turns out that there's an explicit formula. for H in terms of H desire exists. And what is that explicit formula? Let's see what it is. Okay. First of all, H of N, that's your designed impulse response, by the inverse DFT formula kind of thing, is going to be the sum, one, one over N, times the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of what we call h hat sub k times psi sub n to the minus n, to the positive nk and that's for k for n between 0 and kappa n. because h is just the inverse endpoint dft of those h hat sub k's what is h hat sub k for each k It's the value of the desired <coughs> frequency response at frequency point. So it's h hat desired of k2 pi over n. Psi sub n to the plus of nk. What is h hat desired? Let's use equation DTFT. This is going to be the sum from m equals minus infinity to infinity, h desired of m e to the minus j m omega, k2 pi over n, I should say. And now I'm feeling the quicksand closing above my head like we shouldn't have done this. But And you interchange the order of summation. So we have H desired of M. And the inner sum is going to be the sum from K equals 0 to N minus 1. That's a sum. And let's pull the 1 over N in there. of e to the minus j m k 2 pi over n. What is psi n to the n k? Let's figure it out. Psi sub n to the n k is equal to e to the j n k 2 pi over n. Right? So I get e to the j k 2 pi over n times n minus m. OK. So far, so good. Now, this inner parenthesized thing, we've seen this before, sort of. If n equals m, 
And in fact, if n is n minus m is an integer multiple of capital N, this parenthesized thing, all the terms are 1. There's n of them. They're divided by n. You get 1. If n minus m is not an integer multiple of capital N, it turns out you get 0. So it turns out that the parenthesized thing, and this is you can prove this as an exercise. It's in the monograph. <clears throat> The parenthesized thing equals 1 when n minus m is an integer multiple of capital N. 0 otherwise. So this is an integer r. And that means that the whole sum of h desires of m only ranges over m's that are of the form n plus rn. I know this is a lot to... Did you ever feel like you were in an episode of The X-Files? No. Good. So thus, only the m values of the form m equals n plus r capital N for some r in the integers contribute to the sum for h of n. And what do we have? We have the bottom line here. That, well, actually, this is the, the pen bottom line, or whatever like the second to last line is. h of n is equal to the sum from r equals minus infinity to infinity h desired of n plus r n or n minus is it n minus or n plus n minus r n let's do it that way or in our cool sleek notation that doesn't involve of n's h equals the sum over all r of shift sub rn of h desired. So this is the cool explicit formula for the designed FIR system approximation in terms of h desired. Now I want to draw a picture, or two, to show how this quantifies this business about most of the activity, blah, 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 blah. And to make this picture work, I'm, I'm going to draw curves instead of dots and stuff, just so you get to see what's going on. So suppose H desire looks like this, something like this. Say, just say it's causal, so it's zero for time, less than zero, and then it, it does stuff for a while, and then it sort of peters out. It doesn't go all the way to zero, but say it peters out around here. This is and this is n, say. So this is what I mean by most of the activity in H desired occurs on the interval zero through n minus one. What does H look like? H looks like this picture, shifted by n, shifted by n, shifted by n in both directions. All those terms added together. So then, H is the sum of these graphs. One that looks just like that. So here's n. One that looks like this. One that starts at minus n. Right? And one that looks like this. Starts out here. 
and this one doesn't contribute at all, and so on. So on 0 to n, and this is just on the interval 0 less than equal to n <coughs> less than n, remember h itself is 0 outside of there, this thing pollutes a little bit. The ones to the right don't pollute at all, and the ones to the left always pollute a little bit, but less and less and less and less. Okay? So h of n looks like h desired of n on 0 less than or equal to n less than capital N with a little bit of pollution from other shifts. Okay, so anyway, the more the activity of H desired is focused in 0 to n, the better the designed impulse response matches H desired on 0 to n, and the extreme example where it's all focused on 0 to n, there's no pollution. No pollution. Hang on one second. What do, we, what do you think people call this phenomenon when there is pollution? We've seen pollution between shifted replicas of stuff in this class before, and we had a name for it. Aliasing. People actually call this, they call it time aliasing. Time aliasing. So this pollution is, quote unquote, time aliasing. So that's something you can look up. Okay, now, Alex, you can ask your question. Yeah, that's, that's another way to do it, is, is just truncate the impulse response. What's that again? It is simpler, but, you know, it's, it's another one of those things where it's not clear how, better, how much better it approximates. You know, like, there's all these things like Gibbs phenomena and all that stuff going on. You know, is it better to do this, or is it better to truncate? These are all different ways of, quote unquote, designing FIR filters. And we used to have a course, like EC4250, back in the day, used to be a course that was largely about FIR filter design, but that's kind of passe. You know, we, we, they talk about frequency sampling, they talk about truncation, they talk about all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, that is a way to do it. Any other questions? Okay, sorry I kept you, I owe you a minute. <laughs>